Good morning, church. The renovation workers are out having lunch right now, and the noise is down, so now is the time to preach. So our preaching text for today is taken from 1 Corinthians. And if you listen to that lesson, you may be asking, why is a text about sacrificing food offered to idols relevant to any of us today? Here's why. It's not really about food at all. It's about church family and how we are interconnected and how we have a responsibility to each other. Ultimately, this is about how we love our neighbors inside of our community and beyond our community, inside our tribe and outside of our tribe. Since we have become, these last number of decades, very us versus them, these last number of years, the text is very relevant for us. Let's explore Paul's advice to his Corinthian community, who are known for having internal squabbles. Some of the people in the Corinthian church were eating meat, which had been sacrificed to idols, which was a normal reality in Corinth. This was very upsetting for some of the newer believers in this Corinthian church. They felt that Christians should have nothing to do with eating anything remotely related to pagan worship. The congregation was unable to come to a solution over this issue, so they wrote to the Apostle Paul seeking advice. For Paul, here is the underlying principle. The church is a family. It's an interconnected group of people. This message can also be extended to being part of an, an American family. In a family, we care about one another. In a family, we care about each other's welfare. We care about each other's feeling. We're not just a club. We're not just a political entity. We're family. With the recent passing of Hank Aaron, I am reminded of another great baseball giant, Larry Doby. Doby was one of baseball's finest hitters. Perhaps you know the story of Doby's entrance into the Major League Baseball. Doby was the first African American to play for an American League team. The year was 1947. He was the second black player to break baseball's color barrier. Doby was a promising rookie for the Cleveland Indians. He didn't look promising, however, that first time at bat. He was tense and nervous. He swung at three pitches and missed each of them badly by at least two feet. His first time at bat, he didn't get within a foot of the ball. Slowly, he walked to the dugout with his head in his hands. He picked out a seat at the end of the bench, and there rested his head in his hands. A player by the name of Joe Gordon was on the same team, and Joe was under an outstanding second baseman. He batted right after Doby. Gordon had a good batting average against this particular preacher who was on the mound that day, but something quite extraordinary was about to happen. The stuff of baseball legend. Joe Gordon went up to the plate and missed all three pitches in a row, each of them by at least two feet. Then he walked slowly to the end of the bench and sat down next to Larry Doby. Then Joe Gordon slowly put his head in his hands. Did Joe Gordon strike out that day deliberately? We'll never know. However, it's interesting to note that every time Larry Doby went out on the field from that day on, he first picked up Joe Gordon's glove and tossed it to him. That's family. That's caring for someone else's success. The church at Corinth had some folks who did not really care about the spiritually newer members of the congregation. 
they consider themselves spiritually enlightened. In their opinion, they did no wrong in eating food that was sacrificed to idols. After all, idol worship was just a lot of superstition anyway. Why waste a good steak? They simply refused to have any regard for the feelings of those newer members of the faith who had once been idol worshipers and wanted to leave all of that behind them, leave as much behind them as possible. These newer believers were highly offended that some in the group were eating this forbidden fare. Paul wants both groups to think like family and to encourage and support one another. And that's the first reason that we take this text so seriously. It reminds us that we're family, we're interconnected, and that means we have responsibility for one another. One time, a woman was flying on a plane across the country. She was feeling sorry for herself and a little bit angry for different reasons, and she was very annoyed at the sniffling of this little boy sitting beside her. She scolded the man on the other side of the child for not taking care of him. This child isn't with me, he said. I thought he was with you. Little boy wiped his tears and said, I'm with nobody. When my aunt Aggie gets tired of me in New York, she sends me back to California. And when my aunt in California doesn't want me either, she sends me back to New York. I was kind of scared and wished somebody would pay attention to me. So what did the woman do? She forgot about herself. She put her arms around the little boy and he snuggled up next to her and he fell asleep with a smile on his face. Of such love is the kingdom of God. We're family. We have responsibility for one another we are interconnected. Okay, says Paul, legalism is no longer part of the faith. There is nothing really wrong with eating meat that has been offered to idols, but if it bothers newer persons in this congregation, is it worth it? We're family. We love one another. We have responsibility for one another. Hear what Paul is saying. Love for one another is the foundation of our faith. Let's put that love into practice, both inside of the congregation and then take it out into the world and share that love. Those Corinthian believers could not see that their enlightened faith was worthless if it did not produce love. Later on, Paul would call such loveless faith nothing but a clanging symbol. We're family. We have a responsibility to one another. Love is the foundation of our faith. If we do not care about others in our fellowship, our faith is meaningless. And here's the best thing. There is a wonderful benefit. Love for one another produces spiritual growth. If we are not growing in our relationship with Christ, it is probably because we are not deeply loving one another enough. When we take responsibility for a ministry of encouragement and inclusion, a ministry of love, we find ourselves becoming more like Jesus. Let me end with this example. A group of war refugees are planning to escape over a rough and devious route. The leaders hesitated about taking a mother and her little girl because they feared that the girl would not be strong enough to make the journey. They finally decided that the men of the group would take turns carrying the child. The refugees had walked three days when the terrain became more difficult. One old man became weary and unable to keep up with the others. He begged the others to just go on without him and let him just die. The group grudgingly agreed and started out again. But the mother ran back and placed the child into the old man's arms. 
You can't quit, she said. It's your turn to carry my little girl. She left with the others, but looked back and saw the old man walking determinedly, determined after getting the little girl into his arms. St. Paul says, there is nothing wrong with eating meat that has been offered as a sacrifice to an idol. However, if eating meat will cause a brother or sister to stumble, then he will not do it. That is mature Christian love in action. It's selfless love. We are family. We are interconnected. We have a responsibility to one another. In fact, love, loving one another, is at the foundation of our faith. In this week ahead, let us find new ways to exercise self-giving love for one another and grow and be more like Jesus. Amen.